All right, let's get going with the quiz questions. There were two relevant quiz questions. And again, I haven't graded everybody that got theirs turned in, but I, I checked through some of them. Um, somebody asked about why are there only eight electrons beyond just because I said so. Um, the reason that happens is because, remember, the number of electrons you can hold or the number of possible suborbitals in each orbital type goes up in a predictable pattern. And the reason that they're limited like this is because the number of solutions that you can have in each energy level, in each orbital type, basically the number of types of harmonics that you can have in each of these orbitals goes up as... Um, by two times odd integer. I'm sorry, it goes up by, is that right? By the odd integers. So one, three, five, F is seven, G would be 14, or seven would be um, nine. And that just is the, the number of harmonics that you can kind of fit on the string. If you want to go back to that the guitar playing analogy. Right? And so it's it's really limited by the physics. The reason it behaves like that is entirely based on as you get to higher and higher energy levels, you get to have more types of harmonics that still give you a valid solution to Schrodinger's equation. Um, and, so, and that's really our limit to how many electrons can fit into each of these um, each of these orbital types. And so the reason that we say that a valence electron or for a valence shell can hold um, eight is our standard because that fills these two orbital types. And once you get past the P orbitals, then we wind up with the D orbitals are actually at one energy level offset. Remember doing that? So you can have valence, a, um, an element that has a valence or has up to 18 valence electrons, but typically only once they've lost those electrons from the 4S orbital or from the 5S orbital. So for the most part, just thinking about it in terms of eight works the best. That's why they refer to it as the octet rule. It's the general rule for the system, for most systems. Um, and again, the only time you get the D orbital involved in the valence shell is after you've already removed, um, say, the 4S electrons or the 5S electrons. And then you wind up with the D block being part of um, the, the valence shell. So it it comes back to those to those quantum numbers. There's only certain possible values of those quantum quantum numbers. And that limits that plus the Pauli exclusion principle that says that no two electrons can have the same set of quantum numbers, can have the same address, means that we're limited in how many electrons go into each of these energy levels. So you actually had the tools, but we hadn't talked about those quantum numbers in a ton of detail in a while. Um, and the shape of the periodic table and the octet rule is just the, the consequence of those rules for quantum mechanics. Um, and then several of you asked questions about, you know, what's the most toxic or what's the most dangerous element on the periodic table or why are some things toxic in their elemental form, but not in their uh, everyday form like sodium and chloride. So sodium metal is, is not toxic, but it's very, very reactive and it's very, very exothermic. So if you tried to eat sodium metal, you'd burn yourself and, and potentially have it explode in your mouth. Um, so not recommended, zero out of 10. Um, and chlorine gas is pretty similar. Chlorine is super, super reactive. It's actually not toxic in the sense that it's poisonous, it's dangerous in the sense that it's reactive. So reactive just means it's gonna react with something and oftentimes things that are very reactive react violently, meaning they give off a lot of heat, it could catch fire, it could explode, um, or at the very least, they kind of destroy whatever they react with in, time, in biological systems. So sodium chloride though, once it's a sodium ion, it's stable. Sodium ions are stable because they've already reacted. It's already given away that extra electron. And so sodium ions are what we actually eat as salt. 
and chloride ions are really stable and real and relatively non-toxic. Everything's toxic in, in the right dose, but for the most part, chlorides are pretty safe um, because they've already reacted. So sodium metal, dangerous. Chlorine gas, dangerous. Sodium ion, tasty. Chloride ion, harmless. Um, and that also applies to, it, a lot of it depends on your definitions. The other question, the other person asked the question about what's the most dangerous element. It depends on what you mean by dangerous. If you mean reactive, the most reactive elements are fluorine when it's in its elemental state um, and uh, francium are the two extremes. Francium is extremely dangerous because it wants to give away an electron so much to the point where if you actually got francium in its metallic state, it'll spontaneously just throw an electron out into space. Um, very, very few things will give away an electron without having something around to accept it. Francium is so good at giving away an electron, its ionization energy is actually negative. So you actually have to put energy into it to get it to hold on to the electron, as opposed to everything else where you have to put energy in to remove an electron. It's backwards. Um, and then fluorine is the exact opposite. Fluorine wants so badly to gain electrons that it'll steal them from anything that it runs into, which is a problem when what it runs into are things like, um, you know, your lungs. Um, so, you know, fluorine is, extreme, and it's very, very exothermic when it does react. It gives off a ton of heat and can wind up causing explosions and things like that too. Um, there is a video online. There's, so cesium, Cesium is not quite as bad as francium, but it's easier to make. But there's entire research labs dedicated to like, here's how we're going to make metallic cesium and then do some tests with it. And there's entire research groups dedicated to we're going to do some tests with fluorine. And so actually two of those groups got together um, and they actually had cesium metal react with fluorine gas. They were generated them both together and then let them react. And that's one of the most exothermic reactions that you can have, especially out of things that in their pure elemental form. Um, and they, made a, they made a pretty good YouTube video about it too. I'll see if I can find that link. I don't remember where it was or what the channel it was. It might've been the Royal Society of Chemistry. Mary? So in the sense of like, like the argument, like I keep hearing that when you drink it, it's not supposed to be electrolytes and like electrolytes are electrolytes. And like, so like, is it like mixed with like water? Does that mean like, is it toxic though? Or is it like yeah, so when you add, when you chlorinate a pool, you don't add chlorine gas directly. You add chlorine in the form of a polyatomic ion that when it's, when it's dissolved in water will spontaneously react slowly to produce very small amounts of chlorine gas. So it can still be bad for you to be in there. And if you've ever been in a, in a chlorine pool that has recently been shocked, um, they made the mistake of doing that when I was playing water polo in high school and they, they shocked the pool and they didn't tell our coach and our coach just thought that we needed to man up and practice in it in any way, anyway. Um, and we definitely got some lung damage from that. That was a, a net negative to our conditioning as a team um, because we were inhaling too much of the chlorine. But it's all about just getting it to produce it at small enough levels, right. And it's still not good for your skin, but it's better than like cholera. So, you know, it's, everything's about trade-offs there. Landon? That's what your eyes burn underwater. Um, and there's, and that's also why the difference in temperature is why you don't chlorinate a hot tub. You actually put bromine in a hot tub. You use a similar process, similar compound, except you use a, a bromine-based polyatomic ion instead of a chlorine-based polyatomic ion. Because the difference in temperature, the bromine is produced slower than the chlorine is. If you, if you used chlorine in a, in a hot tub, you would actually generate the chlorine too quickly. And so you'd wind up um, causing more, more damage to you. And that's what, you know, warm pools typically are worse for you smell chlorine more in a warm pool than a cold pool. All right. Any other ran random questions about toxicity or reactivity? They're not really that random. They're actually fairly relevant to the stuff we've been going over. So, all right.
One quick note. Um, let me. Let's look at that list of polyatomic ions real quick. I forgot to include that in today's uh, lecture. So let me switch back to the lecture from Friday. So, and a reminder, listen up everybody. Um, the uh, quiz on the polyatomic ions is a week from today. Sorry, a week from tomorrow, next Tuesday, right? So you still have a few days to, keep, to study. And where's our list of poly, there they are. All right, let's, so here's our list of polyatomic ions and polyatomic ions in general, they're basically a covalent compound that can't fill all of the valences without a couple extra electrons for the most part. So they're covalently attached together. All of these, these um, polyatomic ions have covalent bonds holding them together. Um, but you just, for, in, in, for numerous reasons, you, for a lot of them, you can't get to their most stable state without a couple of extra electrons or one extra electron. All right, so we're, we're gonna talk about these and, uh, and do some Lewis dot structures for these as well because they still follow all of our rules for Lewis dot structures as well. So we can still do that. Um, but there's a couple of things I wanted to talk about first. Um, and that's mainly that, that there are some, um, some trends that we can use. The way things are named that'll help us remember charges and formulas. Charges too, formula and charges, all right? And you'll have the periodic, I'm not going to take down the periodic tables. We don't need to go do it over in the library because you'll have, you know, you can use the periodic table sitting in front of you. The main thing is, is that you can get the right formula and charge. All right, because that's going to really help us when it comes to our nomenclature as well. Um, but there's a few common ways that these things are named that help us remember what the charges are. Basically, if you can remember everything that ends in eight, A-T-E, that's going to help because a lot of the other related polyatomic ions are based around that. You just modify the existing formula. So for instance, if you, you know nitrate is NO3 with a one minus charge, nitrite, anytime you see an ite, I-T-E, it's the same formula, the same charge, just missing an oxygen. So if you know that this is nitrate, nitrite NO2 with a one minus charge. The charge is not changing for the eights versus the ites. And that's true for all of these too. There's a number of, so you've got phosphates and phosphites, nitrates and nitrites, chlorates and chlorites, sulfates and sulfites. So effectively it cuts the number that you have to memorize in half if you can remember that rule. Memorize the eights, and then the ites are the same thing minus an oxygen. Um, and you can further do that too. The most common, uh, the chlorates are the ones that are on there that, um, that we'll look at right now. So chlorate is ClO3 with a minus one charge. So we can get chlorite from that ClO3 two with a minus one charge. If you take one more oxygen away, we call it hypochlorite. Hypo means without, right? Like being hypoglycemic. But hypoglycemic means not enough sugar in your bloodstream. Glycemic means sugar. So hypochlorite just means you take one more oxygen away. And then there's per goes the opposite. Per is actually short, uh, short for either hyper or super. Per means extra. So perchlorate is chlorate with an extra oxygen. But all of them, 
chlorine, they all have the same charge and they follow the same pattern, right? Not all of these substances have common polyatomic, like there's not, per sulfate is not a common polyatomic ion. Neither is hyposulfite is not a common polyatomic ion, but they, if they're, we could predict what those charges were if we know these rules, right? Me memorize the eights and then know how to adjust them. Lila? Right, we're, just doing it on we're just doing it on this list right here, right? And this is far, somebody asked a, a quiz question about polyatomics um, a couple of weeks ago. And basically there's not really a hard limit to how many polyatomic ions exist. But on Earth, given our conditions here and the elements that are naturally present on Earth, these are some of the most common polyatomics that you see. But really, you can have polyatomic ions that are really large. You can have um, big organic polyatomic ions that are carbon-based, that have a whole bunch of carbons. Um, the smallest of those is acetate, which is one of our most complicated formulas, right? Acetate is C2H3O2 with a negative one charge. The other way of writing that is CH3CO2 with a negative charge. Basically, we can start tacking on more and more carbons and more and more other atoms on here and make it larger and larger molecule. And there's not really a hard limit to how big you can, you can go. You just, at some point, you stop considering a polyatomic ion and you start treating it like an organic molecule instead, or even a protein. Most proteins are polyatomic ions but they just have formulas where you've got, you know, a couple hundred carbons and, and a hunt and you pretty easily get over, you know, a C200, O100, N100, a couple sulfurs and a couple other elements in there with a charge. That whole thing is, could be considered one large polyatomic ion, but I'm not gonna make you memorize, not even a chemist would use a polyatomic ion naming system for that you would name it like the protein just call it pepsin or just call it catalase or whatever it is <clears throat> all right so with that in mind these are the ones we're going to we're going to pay the most attention to the ones that we'll use the most when we start doing nomenclature and when we start um when we start doing um when we start looking at lewis dot structures for these is there. So this is just pointing out the, all the eights and eights relative to each other. You could, in theory, have per sulfate, but it'd be SO5 with the two minus. It doesn't really exist in nature, but in theory, we could use the same naming system to predict what the formula would be. Um, the other one that I want to point out is that some of these, we just throw hydrogen on front of it. A hydrogen, when you say hydrogen phosphate, that's still phosphate, except that we add a hydrogen on the front and that actually changes the charge. So we're not actually adding just hydrogen, we're adding a hydrogen ion. So if phosphate is PO4, three minus, hydrogen phosphate is HPO4. If we added an H plus to it though, that's gonna change our charge by one. So it'd be two minus, or you could have dihydrogen phosphate would be H2PO4. Now it's one minus. So you can get to it from looking at valence electrons and counting how many electrons you need to get everything to be stable. Um, the easiest way at this point is to memorize it because you're not going to want to spend the time to go through that process every time because there are some exceptions in there and some weirdness to how you do that. Um, one of the ways that you can think about it though is that your polyatomic ions should never have an odd number of electrons. Odd numbers of electrons are exceedingly <laughs> unstable. Because that means you've got some electron, you've got an energy level somewhere that's not completely filled. If all of our orbitals are filled, we have to have an even number of electrons, right? So if you're trying to remember if phosphate is a, is a two minus or a three minus, 
you can look at where phosphorus is on there and say, oh, well, phosphorus has got, I know all my oxygens are always an even number of electrons. Phosphorus has got five electrons in its valence. So that means the charge has to be odd. Right, so you can get back to it in terms of if you're on the test and like, I'm, I know all of these are just a bunch of oxygens that are all even, figuring out what the charge is, we can at least limp, um, you know, make it a 50-50 shot. It's either going to be a, a, a minus one or a minus three if it's phosphorus. And same with nitrogen. We know nitrogen is in the same column as phosphorus, so we know the charge on nitrates and nitrates has to be either negative one or a negative three. It can't be a negative two. And sulfur is the same way, right? Sulfur is, has to be an even number of electrons instead of an odd number of electrons. Or you can memorize it. Um, memorizing it will be the most expedient way to do it. But again, I would use that as a way to sort of, if you can't, if you're down to, I remember everything but the charge on sulfate and then figure out if it has to be an even number of electrons or an odd number of electrons and go from there. Does that make sense? Does that kind of answer your question too? All right, were there any others on here that I wanted to point out? I don't think that one's complete. I think there's a few other ones. I don't have arsenate or on, uh, on here as well. Um, so that there's a, a little bit of a di different textbooks will have a different list. This is the list that I've compiled that I think makes the most sense. Um, based on on what we go go with that you'll notice there's no bromates on there but there are bromates in real life but if you know how to name the chlorates the bromates are the exact same so i'm not going to make you memorize the bromates as well <clears throat> all right any other questions on these for right now and again everybody knows how to get to the slides on on canvas right I post these all as, as a PDF, so you don't need to take the picture. You feel free to take pictures with your phones. But if it's something you want to refer back to, go find the PDF on the Canvas. Um, and then you can, you can print it out, study from there. All right. Was there anything else I wanted to get go through here before... So if we're naming compounds, remember for our ionic nomenclature, the only thing we have to do to name them is just say the name of the ions. That means if it's a transition metal, we might need to use those Roman numerals to say what the charge is. And it means that you might have to know what the polyatomic ions are in order to get the, the correct formula from this, uh, from the name or the correct name from the formula. But that's literally all there is to it. Say the name of the cation, say the name of the anion. So magnesium and SO4 2 minus. What's SO4 2 minus? Sulfate. So, and what's the name of the cation then? Magnesium. Is there anything else to add? Any Roman numerals for magnesium? No, it's in column two, so that's our that's the easy ones, right? And the name of the anion is sulfate. So it's just magnesium sulfate. What's the formula going to be? MgSO4. Just like before. Just like when we're doing stuff on the periodic that's right off the periodic table, you just want their charges to add up to zero. What about, let's do the bottom right example. What, what polyatomic ion is that? Chlorate. And we know that's aluminum, right? And we need to specify the charge on aluminum. Now, aluminum is one of those six that always has the same charge, right? Aluminum only has, doesn't have a full D block, so it behaves basically the way we would expect it to. It's better if you, it's better to be redundant than to leave off information you need. 
right? So if you're unsure on the test, write aluminum three. It's but it's just a little bit redundant to do that. Make sense? So our name of our compound is aluminum chlorate. So what's the what's the formula going to look like? How do we write the formula here? How many of each of them do we need? We need three chlorates and one for every one aluminum, right? So Al, how do we, how are we going to write that though? Parentheses. Bingo. ClO three three. Don't distribute this three. The temptation is to distribute that and just write Cl3O9. The problem with that is that when it's written like this, it's really easy to see that that's a chlorate, right? If I write Cl3O9, who knows what the heck that is? That could just be some really weird thing that has a totally different formula and charge than what we're used to. We don't, we want to keep that separate so we can say it's a chlorate and there's three of them because that lets us work backwards to the charge better. For instance, how about uh, potassium phosphate? Go the other direction. What's the, what's the, uh, Formula for phosphate, including the charge. Including the charge. Minus three. Phosphate is one of the only ones that's got a negative three charge. And remember, because phosphate's in the fifth column, it's got to have um, an odd number of electrons so that the total number of electrons is even. Okay. Not quite. There are other cases, so I can't say that generally. There are patterns like that, but they're not hard rules, so I hesitate to tell you to do it that way. But if it helps you remember that, you can think of these examples. All right. So then how many potassiums do we need? Bring it back, everybody. Three. So then our formula winds up being K3PO4. Right. And again, it would be, you can put this in parentheses if you want to, even if there's just one of them, but it's unnecessary. If there's only one polyatomic ion in the formula, we usually just write it like that. All right, so if you had if you had a list of polyatomic ions to work from, and you had um, you know, a big packet of practice problems, it shouldn't be too hard to make your way through that, right? No. That's what our assignment is going to be for Tuesday and Thursday of this week, is just, just practice. Use it as a way, if you do it right, then you shouldn't need to study your polyatomic ions as much over the weekend to get ready for the quiz, right? You already have it scheduled, and I'm making you go through this packet and do it. Might as well make the most of it. Save yourself some work over the weekend. Minute for next Tuesday? Uh, no. So, but Tom's will be back. Oh, I remember what the other thing I was going to say about the hydrogens is. Um, the packet that you're going to have. Has a, uses a, a slightly old school way of naming the hydrogen based compounds. So carbonate is CO3 with a two minus. Hydrogen carbonate is the name that's on your list. However, Thompson's room. No problem, but wrong number. Um, so hydrogen carbonate is the name that's on your list. The old school way of naming it, because that's a mouthful, yeah. is they would say bicarbonate. Um, that's not bi as in two. 
it's does I don't even know what the Latin root is where why they decided to do that. But if you see bicarbonate, that means hydrogen carbonate. All right, and the, and there's uh, sulfate is the other one that where they frequently do that. You'll see bisulfate or bisulfite in a few, a few of these places. Um, when we're talking polyatomic ions, bi doesn't mean two, it means there's a hydrogen on it. Max, did you have a question? Okay. All right, so for the most part, I'm gonna try not to say that, but it, it is does make it a lot shorter. The other place you may have seen that is, um, any, anybody do much baking? Anybody know the scientific name for baking soda? Sodium bicarb is the way that they refer to it. It's short for sodium bicarbonate or sodium hydrogen carbonate is what baking soda is. Um, if you watch the British baking show, I believe there are a few times where the, the bakers will say something like that because it's more commonly used term in, uh, in England, in the UK than it is in the US these days. All right. One last note about nomenclature before we get to more interesting things. Nomenclature is not anybody's idea of a good time, um, but we're going to need to pay attention to it because it's going to be how we can communicate unambiguously. So. We have our ionic nomenclature down. Say the name of your cation, say the name of your anion. Molecular compounds or covalent compounds. We just say whatever, however many of them we have, and we put the less electronegative element first. So uh, oxygen, if there's oxygen involved, oxygen is almost always gonna be the second element that you say. But basically, you just use those numerical prefixes. So N2O5 would be dinitrogen pentoxide. Right? And if you if you uh, kept the A on penta, you wrote penta oxide. I'm not going to mark you wrong. Because that is an irregular, and it doesn't interfere with somebody knowing what you're trying to say, right? If you say pentaoxide instead of pentoxide, nobody's going to be confused by that. Right? And that's always my metric for nomenclature. All right, the last thing is a third class of chemicals that get named a little bit differently. Acids. An acid is just, it's basically an ionic compound where your cation is hydrogen. If you have an ionic compound where your cation is hydrogen, that's because of the biological importance of acids and how commonly they show up, we actually have a different naming system for acids, right? And so it's based around the end of the, or the suffix at the end of your anion. So anytime you see, if you just see acid, you know that you're going to just add as many hydrogens as it takes to make the charge add up to zero, just like with any other ionic compounds. The rest of the name is based on those suffixes, though. So if you have a, a anion that ends in I, so for instance, fluoride. If you add enough hydrogens to make that neutral, what's the charge on a fluoride ion? Minus one. So how many H pluses do we have to add to balance that out? Just one. So HF is the formula for hydrofluoridic acid, right? And so... When you have an I, you just take that, you put hydro in front, and then say acid at the end. 
So fluoride turns into hydrofluoric acid, or hydro, sorry, hydrofluoric acid. I'm not sure why fluoridic sounded right to me. Um, hydrofluoric acid, hydrochloric acid, hydrobromic acid, hydroionic acid, which is a mouthful and it looks like you're spelling it wrong because there's a whole bunch of vowels in a row. But that's the proper way to spell that. Did, were any of our polyatomic ions just that? What property is those? It's those hydrogens. It turns out that those hydrogens, when you when you dissolve this in water, acids give away these H pluses really easily. They break that bond really easily, and that can cause a lot of different physiological effects, like denaturing proteins, causing biological molecules to basically fall apart. So because acids wind up being really both common and they have a lot of physiological importance, they get their own naming system. But really, um, in a perfect world, we'd name the acids the same way we named ionic compounds. We would just say hydrogen nitrate, nitrate or something like that. Um, did any of our polyatomic ions end in hide? There's at least one. Cyanide. So cyanide, we actually would drop the ide, and we, it would be hydrocyanic acid. That's about the most complicated one you get with these ides. Most of the ides are things that are just on the periodic table that have a negative charge. All right, what are the other suffixes that are on the period on our polyatomic ion list? What are some of the other? Go ahead. No, that's a prefix. The end. Suffix is eight. There we go. No, Gabby, I appreciate you answering, even when you're not sure if it's the right answer. I would much rather have that than have a quiet classroom. I say that after I've been trying to get you guys to be quiet all day. But. Um, if it ends in an eight, same basic idea, except you don't put hydro in front of it. It's just ic acid. So nitrate with enough hydrogens to make it neutral, the HNO3. The name for that would just be nitric acid. If it was sulfate, it'd be sulfuric acid. If it's chlorate, it'd be chloric acid. What would this? What would the uh, formula be for sulfuric acid? What's the charge on sulfate? Minus two. So how many H pluses do we need? So it'd be H2SO4. And the name of that would be sulfuric acid. And then the last, there's one other suffix at the end of our polyatomics. It's ite. Ite turns into us. Right, so hypochlorite turns into hypochlorous acid. Sulfite turns into sulfurous acid. Right, so it's it's all about these suffixes and then just throwing the word acid on the end. And there's a couple ways to memorize these. Um, there's, I've heard, let's see, my ride has hydraulics. Way to remember all those that those go together. I ate something icky. Sprite is delicious. There's really dumb stuff like that you can use to memorize these. Mine is I shouldn't I shouldn't cast stones because mine is even dumber. Um, when I first learned this in high school, I was good friends with a guy named Titus, 
And I just thought I S sounded like Titus. So now every year when I teach this, I think about my friend from high school named Titus. And now you will too think about my friend Titus when you think about this. Like I said, it's dumb. It's real dumb. But you should be able to remember it goes with us. And then I always remembered that the the simplest formulas have the most complicated name. Again, dumb. But that's how I remembered hydrochloric acid has the simplest formula and the most complicated name. Is how I remembered that I goes with the hydro ick. And then I was just remembered eight and ick were just was just the other combination with the other ones. Um, so find something that works for you. Um, bonus points if it's so dumb you can't possibly forget. Not literal bonus points, but you'll get bonus points in that you will get 100% on naming assets when you get this on the test. All right, that's everything you need to work on the assignment, the nomenclature assignment for this week. Um, the other announcement I was going to say that I forgot to mention earlier, so, so a week from tomorrow is the polytonic ions quiz. The Tuesday after that will be the first part of your midterm. Right, so two weeks from tomorrow, and then the day after that will be the second. We're gonna we will break up the midterm into two days this time, so there's a little bit less time pressure. And that means next Tuesday I'll give you a practice test. Next Tuesday you'll have a practice test, and it'll be the exact same format of everything that you'll have um, for the following week. And I'll I'll even tell you where it'll where I'll break it up. It'll probably be six questions the first day or the second day. It's or it will take a little bit longer. They will be due at the end of this week, but it'll just be whatever I got graded by then. I'll try to I'm gonna try to catch up on grading some of your backlog assignments by then, but you won't have anything in the exams category by then. So I'm it'll basically just be a placeholder. We don't, in this class, we're not going to reset grades at midterm. I understand that a lot of classes do that, start over again after midterm. Is that, is that accurate? Yes. It's not what we're going to do in this class. Your grades carry over the whole time because I don't like dealing with resetting the grades like that. It doesn't make any sense to me. So everything will be on your final grade. And if your final grade is different than your midterm grade, then Thomas and I will go through during after we grade finals, and if you if it matters in a positive way, you really want to go back and change your midterm grade to be what your final grade is, um, then we will do that for you. But it show it so that it doesn't affect eligibility. In general, everybody's grades are probably going to be higher um, if you've been turning in assignments than they will be after we start taking exams. So for the most part, it's something that, especially if you've been turning in your assignments, um, it should help your GPA on the midterms. Does that make sense? And again, if it does go the other way, if, you're, if your final grade is higher than your midterm grade in this class, I have no problem with us doing the paperwork to go back and change it at the end of the class. Um, we have the ability to do that. It's just almost never is that actually the case. Most people's midterm grades are going to be higher than your final grade because the tests are hard. Does that seem reasonable? That was a lot of administrative stuff to throw in there right now when we're already working on really boring, mind-numbingly boring things. Um, if you want me to go over that or have any more questions about the logistics of any of that, uh, hang out after class, ask me. All right, then Let's do some more conceptual stuff, stuff that's a little bit more interesting. How do we know which of these systems to use? How do we know if it's an ionic compound? Metals and non-metals is your dead giveaway. The exception to that being there is a polyatomic ion, maybe one or two of them, that have a metal in there. So you still, I guess that's still metal and non-metal, and you're going to see those mostly with ionic compounds. Um, but there is a particular, a couple of positively charged polyatomic ions. One that really shows up as comp as a compound more 
NH4 plus. What's that one? Ammonium. Be careful with that because ammonium is the polyatomic ion. The neutral compound is ammonia. And I'm not going to test you on that. I would expect you just to name this as an acid. I think it's actually in the um, in the nomenclature packet that you're going to work on tomorrow. Um, I don't expect you to have the common name memorized. But don't mix mix them up and call NH4 plus ammonia because that is a different thing. So if we have a positively charged polyatomic ion, then we can actually have a covalent compound or an ionic compound that's all nonmetals. Okay, you can have NH4 NO3. What would the name of that compound be? Ammonium nitrate. Fertilizer. When they and also has a Big historical, the process by which they they figured out how to make ammonium nitrate in labs wound up being really really important to history in the 20th century. Basically, it's the reason that World War II dragged on as long as it did. Ammonium nitrate is really important in making gunpowder, as well as other explosives. Uh, does anybody anybody remember the Oklahoma City bombing? Have you heard of that? You wouldn't remember it. it was it was before you were born, but. Um, it was basically a guy who loaded up a pickup truck full of ammonium nitrate fertilizer and rigged it up to blow up. Um, and it was enough to demolish a 10 story, um, a 10 story government building in Oklahoma. So really, this was really important compound historically for that reason, but even more so up until they found a way to make this in a lab, they actually had to mine ammonium nitrate. It was, a, it was a mineral that they had to mine in the most prevalent mines in the early 1900s were in South America. So when World War II broke out, the Western allies figured out or blockaded um, all of those ports from South America and weren't letting the German allies get any of the ammonium nitrate. So they just figured, okay, Germany's gonna run out of explosives and gunpowder and then the war will be over until a guy named Fritz Haber figured out how to make this in a lab synthetically just using electricity and nitrogen from the atmosphere. And all of a sudden now blockading Germany didn't actually stop them from making gunpowder. And so that's why World War II was, was I think six years, who's taken world history more recently than me? Five, five or six years, like that's why it lasted that long. That's, is that why the explosion in Beirut happened? With, like, with yes, the that was the more recent one. There was a there was a warehouse in Beirut that exploded, um, and it was because it was improperly stored ammonium nitrate fertilizer. It got too hot, uh, as I recall, was the was the official explanation. The AC was out, and they stored all the ammonium nitrate stacked up too close together, um, and it got to be it just got to the point where it auto ignited, and then the whole the whole place went up. Um, and that was, that was one of the largest conventional explosions in history, conventional meaning non-nuclear, yeah. um, because it was thousands of tons of ammonium nitrate all going up at once. All right. So other than that, where were we before I started my historical digression? Um, other than ammonium, you see a metal and a non-metal, or a metal and a polyatomic ion, it's an ionic nomenclature. If all you have is non-metals and you don't recognize any polyatomic ions, then it's going to be a molecular compound. It's going to be covalent compounds. If it's all non-metals, but you can still recognize a polyatomic ion in a bunch of hydrogens or one hydrogen, that's going to be an acid, which is also why we write the formula for this compound. We write it out like this. Again, we don't distribute this hydrogen and combine it over here. We don't write C2H4O2 
for this compound, we keep the hydrogen separate because that makes it clear that we've got what? What element or what uh, ion is that? Acetate. Acetate. Ends in an eight. So what's the name going to be? Drop eight, replace it with it. So was acetate, drop the eight, right? Ick, acetic acid. <coughs> also known as, anybody? Common name? <laughs> Sourness, vinegar, yeah. Acetic acid is, is the uh, scientific name for, for, it's actually technically an acetic acid solution is uh, white vinegar. Acetic acid dissolved in water. All right, so if you do wind up having a, a um, polyatomic ion like this, you usually write those hydrogens in the front, so it's clear it's an acid. All right, so there's some practice ones here. Um, just in terms of identifying ionic versus covalent, but I think we just went through that. What are most of these compounds are what? Uh, covalent bonds or ionic? Covalent. Those are all nonmetals, and it doesn't look like a polyatomic ion. So that's covalent. CCL4, also covalent. SO3, also covalent. This is also why we have to memorize the charges on our polyatomics. Because if I wrote SO3 to minus, that'd be what? Sulfite. SO3 with no charge is a covalent compound. We just name it sulfur trioxide. I saw a hand a second while I left. Did you have a question? No. Okay. You did have your hand up for a second, did you? You, you answered it. Okay. All right. Let's let's look at some more um, things. Charge. It's got two extra electrons. And we can actually look at it in terms of when we look at the um, um, when we look at the Lewis dot structures, it'll be it might make it more clear how that works. But we have to learn, we have to practice those a little bit more before we can do that. All right. So how do we draw Lewis dot structures? Who remembers doing that? And who remembers how to do it? Uh, it's a little shakier. Yes, yeah, start by putting something in the middle. You count up your valence electrons, and then you just sort of, sort of like shake all the electrons around until everything's happy, right? It's more or less. So if we had something like, let's not do SO2 because we haven't covered that exception yet. Um, let's do CH2O. That's a different one because it's got three different elements. That's gonna change how we add up our valence electrons, but it doesn't really change anything up. What should go in the middle out of C, carbon, hydrogen, or oxygen? Why? It has the most electrons, but that means the fewest vacancies, right? We wanna put the one with the most, so carbon should go in the middle. And then we're going to have hydrogen, hydrogen, oxygen. And we're going to figure out how they're all connected here in a second. How many valence electrons do we have to work with? Well, each hydrogen brings one electron, right? Then we've got one carbon that brings four valence electrons and one oxygen that brings six valence electrons. So 12 electrons total, 12 valence electrons total. How can we distribute those so that everything has a full valence? Where should we start? Right? Do you add up six plus four plus one? Is it the 
there's two, two times oh, okay. there's two hydrogens. Okay. What do we know has to be true for this compound? Everything has to be attached, right? Otherwise, it wouldn't be on in the formula. So we can start with that. How many electrons did we just use? That's six. So we have six electrons left. I usually start at the outside and work my way in if I have enough electrons, because typically the least electronegative or the most electronegative elements are the outside. So they're the ones that want the electrons more. So in this case, add six electrons to the oxygen. Now we have no electrons left, right? We used all 12. We're counting them up. Is everything stable? Why not? Carbon's still missing a pair of electrons. So do I just do this? Why not? Because that's not 12 electrons anymore. I just made electrons out of nothing. We don't want that. Violet? So now we do the double bond. We get those double bonds when we don't have enough electrons to fill everything up normally. And it can't be a double bond between a hydrogen and the carbon because hydrogen doesn't have any more electrons to give. All right, so how do we know we could still fill all the valences if we switched the oxygen and the carbon's place, couldn't we? Let me back up. What are our criteria for knowing that we, we drew a Lewis Dobbs structure, right? Anybody remember those? It was right number of electrons. And then what was the second criteria? Why did we have to make the double bond? To do what? For full valence shell. This is our, our criteria for if we have a Lewis dot structure, if we did a Lewis dot structure properly. However, if I wrote it like this, that still meets those two criteria, right? Everything still has a full valence and I used the same number of electrons, didn't I? So how do I know this one's better than that one? But why? That's the rule I taught you for where to place it. So the, the answer is this version, oxygen is sharing more than carbon, right? And if oxygen is more electronegative, we shouldn't make it share more than that. But we want a quantitative way to look at this. And so we're going to introduce what's called formal charge. And it's going to be our third criteria here, formal charge. Formal charges closest to zero. All right. And formal charge is basically we're going to take all of these electrons around the carbon. But this carbon has a total of eight electrons in its valence, so it's stable. But does it really outright own all of those eight electrons? it only really owns four of them because it has these eight electrons, but all the electrons that are in bonds are being actually split between two atoms, right? So if, I, if it doesn't own any of those electrons outright, it's, it has four pairs of electrons that it owns half of each pair. So in, in, that's a roundabout way of saying this carbon 
quote unquote owns four electrons, even though it's got its valence full. How many electrons does carbon have on the periodic table in its valence? Four. So it own it still owns the same number of electrons as it does when it's neutral on the periodic table. So that's it means that it's got a formal charge of zero. So our definition of formal charge is how many electrons it has on the periodic table, number electrons on the periodic table minus number of electrons quote unquote owned. If those are the same number, you get a formal charge of zero. How many electrons does the oxygen own here? Yeah, these ones aren't shared with anybody, right? If they're not shared, the oxygen owns them 100%. So it's got four that it owns outright, and it's got four that are split. That gives it a total of six electrons. How many electrons does it have on the periodic table? Also six. So that means the oxygen also has a formal charge of zero. That this is our way of a formal charge of zero means it's pretty stable. So that's that's sort of like a secondary consideration. It's more important that everything has a full valence. But if there's more than one way you can arrange things, you pick the one where the formal charges are closest to zero. What are the formal charge for? oxygen here. How many does it own? Just four. It's got eight around it and they're all shared, right? So it owns eight. Or sorry, I'm sorry. It owns four. And how many does it have on the periodic table? Six. So six minus the number that it currently owns. That gives it a charge of plus two. In other words, it's like it lost two electrons despite gaining electrons. It's a weird way to think about it, but it's going to make sure that we put the right elements in the right places. So the formal charge here would be plus two. What about for the carbon? How many does it own? It owns four outright, it, and then it has these four that are shared. So it owns a total of six, and it only has four on the periodic table, right? So it has two extra electrons. So this is how you show that this is the right Lewis dot structure. This is the more stable Lewis dot structure. You could conceivably make this compound with everything arranged this way, but it'd be very unstable and it would right away, it would react to turn everything around to rearrange itself to, go, to look like this. Right, so if there is more than one way to do this, you make the, the, the formal charges as close to zero as you can get. Quick way to check your, your numbers on this. Your formal charges should always add up to the overall charge of the molecule or ion. A plus two and a minus two adds up to zero, right? A zero plus a zero also adds up to a zero. So if we did the right number of electrons and we assigned our formal charges properly, they'll always add up to the overall charge. So let's look at nitrate. Nitrate's a good one. This is the first time we've done a Lewis dot structure for an ion, right? But is there anything that's really that different? It just means that counting up the electrons is going to look a little different. What should go in the middle for nitrate? Why? Nitrogen has more vacancies and is less electronegative. So our first guess should be to put nitrogen in the middle. And then we'll check the formal charges at the end to see if that was actually the right call. How 
how many valence electrons do we have for nitrate? Five electrons from the nitrogen. Three oxygens that are all six. six. And then what else? There's a minus one charge. So that means we get one extra electron or one fewer electron? One extra electron. So plus one electron from the charge. That's going to give us a total of 24 electrons to work with, right? So now we just start assigning them. So the only thing that's different about polyatomic ions with the Lewis dot structures is you just need to, you have to either add a couple of electrons or take away an electron based on what the charge is. Other than that, it's the same exact process. So then we just start distributing. Did I add these up? I did add these up, right? Okay. How many electrons did I just use? So we're down to 18 electrons left. Here's why I always start at the outside and work my way in. Each oxygen is still identical at this point, right? And they each need how many? They need to get to eight and they currently have. So we need six more for each of the oxygens, right? What's six times three? So if we just go around and we fill up all of the oxygen valences, that's the last of our electrons. And then we can worry about the nitrogen. No, no electrons left. So now we have to meet our criteria without adding any more electrons. How do we do that? Add a double bond somewhere. Does it matter which oxygen I pick? You don't need to draw the loops. It just helps, especially when I'm doing this on a whiteboard. If I do it like that, it's really easy to miss that that's there. So pick an oxygen, erase one of the pairs and turn it into a bond. We still use a total of 24 electrons, right? So criteria one is check. <laughs> Do we have all the valences filled? Yeah. Nitrogen's got eight electrons around it. That oxygen's got eight. These two, both of these oxygens have eight. Does this get our formal charges cl as close to zero as we can? Let's, let's look at it. First off, what's the other option? I guess let's do this one first and then we'll look at the other option. What's the formal charge on this oxygen? It's got two lone pairs and two bonds, which gives it eight valence electrons, but it only owns half of these ones, right? So it's got six, right? It owns six electrons. And how many does oxygen have on the periodic table? Six valence electrons. So that means this oxygen has a formal charge of zero. And that's what we want. How about these other, these other two oxygens we can do at the same time because they're identical, right? How many, ox how many electrons does this oxygen own? It's got six that it owns outright plus a pair that are shared, right? So six plus one more. So it owns seven electrons. It owns six on the periodic table. So it's got one extra electron. Gives it a charge of minus one. So now what's the charge on the nitrogen? How many does it own? It's got eight around it, but it owns it only owns half of them, right? Because all eight of them of its electrons are in bonds. So it only owns four electrons. 
How many electrons does nitrogen have on the periodic table? Five. Five. So it owns four, but it started with five. What's its charge? Plus one. <clears throat> that means our overall net charge for this molecule is negative one, which is exactly where we started, right? Our formal charges add up to negative one. Could we lower any of these if we switched the nitrogen and, and nitrogen in one of the oxygens? If I switched these up, formal charges get worse, get further away from zero. All right, if you, if we had nitrogen or oxygen, oxygen, nitrogen, oxygen. If we go through and look at all these formal charges, they get further away from zero if you do this. This oxygen becomes a plus two. This nitrogen is a minus two. This oxygen is still a minus one, and this oxygen is still zero. Those are further away from zero. That's less stable than this. All right, good job today. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, the nomenclature packet is online. You can start working on it tonight even if you wanted. Um, otherwise, that's what you're working on tomorrow. And we'll do more Lewis style structures on Wednesday. Yeah. Yeah.